always something you least expect. So now I have to figure out why my screen is reversed. Oh, doesn't seem to be on the live show. All right, interesting. What's up, y'all? What's up, Kenshawn Holistic? Dad, what's going on? Hope everybody is well. Hmm. Kind of decided to do a quick little live, but uh, never really done one uh, from the house before. So bear with me a little. Let me get this straight here. Okay. Now, what's up, Casey? AB, what's going on, man? Y'all know what it is. Onyx Report, Black Masculinist News. And I thought today I would kind of talk a little bit about a piece I ran across very recently. Um, this actually is, is five years old, but I hadn't really delved into it. And I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, so I thought, let me, let me actually delve into this. And it's dealing with an issue that some of you may have some experience with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. What I want to do is I want to go through this article, but uh, it's, it's a little bit long, so I'm going to take my time with it. You know, I'm going to get through as much of it. I might skip some portions that I don't think are immediately relevant. But I want to get to the, the, the guts of it, the crux, if you will. Let's see a few more people in here. Ian, what's up? Kay, what's going on? Angelo, Ron, what's up, Mark? All right. Okay, make sure you like, share, subscribe, join, and donate. Support the channel if you will. Information is on the screen. All right. Do that in a number of ways. You can uh, hit the Patreon. You can hit the Cash App, the PayPal. You can even hit the Venmo. A number of ways to support the channel, so I hope you will. I'm not going to ask uh, too many more times today. I just want to put that out there and get to the core of the discussion. So, okay, hold on. Let's get to it here. Eh, I'm not going to be able to see. Well, hold on. Let me pull the live stream out so I can see the comments separately. Like I said, this is a new format for me. Not, it's not new for YouTube. Obviously, a lot of people use it. I haven't uh, used it a whole lot. There we go. All right. So let's see if I open this up. Does that? Yeah. All right. Okay. So this is a piece you can find on PBS.org. And the title, as you can see there, is The Chicago Doctor Stumbled on a Hidden Epidemic of Fetal Brain Damage. Now, as you can see, the, the, the uh, doctor in question is a brother. Uh, this is Dr. Carl Bell, psychiatrist in Chicago, began sounding the alarm about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder several years ago. And one of the things we're going to look at in a little bit is the reaction people had. Well, most particularly women. What's up, Jerome? Hope everybody's well. All right? Um, about 46 people in here. Support the channel, if you will. Uh, let's get this one out. And if any, any of you have any, you know, updated information you want to share about uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, you know, feel free to do so in the comment section. And we can continue with what we're looking at. So I'm going to read through this at different points and, uh, you know, we can discuss. All right. So uh, this is an article dating back to 2016, but is nonetheless fairly relevant. Chicago, the agitated mom had three kids in foster care and she wanted them back, but she didn't understand how to parent. She'd never worked. She had a short fuse. She was slow and didn't seem to learn from experience. 
Dr. Carl Bell studied the young woman, flat cheeks, thin upper lip, folds at the corner of her eyes. It hit him like a thunderbolt. She had subtle features of fetal alcohol syndrome. Bell had seen thousands of patients like this over the last 40 or over the 40 years, over the past 40 years, excuse me, and, ba and been baffled by their explosive tempers, poor social skills, spotty memories, trouble communicating and learning disabilities. Now, this psychiatrist, now this psychiatrist realized their behavior might be explained by exposure to alcohol in the womb. Bell had stumbled on a hidden epidemic of brain damage concealed by shame and stigma which affects up to 5% of Americans and in poor communities, possibly far more. And that's the key point. In poor communities, possibly far more. That is code, after all, for uh, mainly black communities. Now, that's not to say it doesn't impact other poor communities, but um, this is not accidentally put out. It is definitely dealing with black communities in particular. Uh, but let's go through this. The victims are often misdiagnosed with psychiatric disorders or antisocial tendencies. As kids, they're stuck in special education classes. As adults, they often end up homeless or in jail. They're deemed unruly, uncompliant, out of control. Instead, they may have fetal alcohol spectrum disorder or FASD. No one realizes how common it actually is, said Bell, 68 years old at the time, who is nationally known for his work exploring the impact of trauma on children in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Right? His jolt of recognition in 2012 came as other researchers around the country were beginning to look much more closely at fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. The most recent version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, published in 2013, includes it for the first time as a condition that needs further exploration. Today, FASD is widely recognized as the largest preventable cause of birth defects and de developmental disabilities in the U.S. Hold on, I'm gonna send. A, I'm gonna post a link real quick uh, somewhere. Let me put it up in Facebook real quick, and then I will close it so you, it won't keep beeping all throughout the session. Bear with me for one second. I usually do this through Streamyard, so it does it for me. But I am, like I said, trying out some new things here basic things, but new to me. Right? Uh, yeah. Now, one of the reasons this does impact poor communities is because for the most part, when things become economic, economically depressed, people move to escape. Escape can be expensive, right? But there are many different forms of escape. Um, on the lighter end, you have video games, you have, you know, whatever. On the heavier end, you have substance abuse, you know, Alcohol has always been cheap, readily available, easy to get. So there you go. Nevertheless, um, let's get back to it. So it says no one realizes how common it actually is, said Bell, 68. Um, oh, sorry, I already read that. Let me scroll down a little. He says, I've never been so stunned in my life. In 2014, a team of researchers led by Philip May of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill published a seminal paper showing that two to five percent of first graders in a largely white, large, uh, largely middle-class Midwestern city had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. At the far end of that spectrum lies um, FASD, uh, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, identified in 73. Children affected have intellectual disabilities, small heads, stunted growth, and unusual characteristic facial features, small eyes, thin upper lip, and a smooth area between the nose and that lip known as the philtrum. Okay. Okay, here we go. So other people on the spectrum lack these distinctive physical features, but are troubled by poor judgment, difficulty planning, impulsivity, and distractibility. They're often behind in speech and language skills and have trouble performing tasks in a sequence. May's report hit a nerve. Previous estimates of the prevalence of FASD have been much lower, but his calculations may still underestimate the problem. Two new reports yet to be published will show that fetal alcohol disorders are more common than may calculated. According to Julie Cable, an assistant professor of psychiatry at Emory University who studies FASD. Bell suspected the numbers would still be, would be higher in poor, tough neighborhoods where liquor stores can be found on every other block. So he, con he conducted a formal study of 611 of his psychiatric patients on Chicago's South Side. Nearly 40% had FASD. Damn. 
It wasn't a representative uh, sample of the population and Bell wasn't administering sophisticated diagnostic tests, but the results were eye-opening. No one had looked at the prevalence of FASD in low-income African-American communities before, Bell said, I've never been so stunned in my life. Now, this is something we can look at, especially post, um, I mean, really, you look at urbanization in the mid 20th century, by the time you get to the 60s and 70s, particularly during deindustrialization, I think uh, the impact on uh, births, particularly in Generation X, you can begin to see this uh, more readily. All right. What's up, Oscar? What's up, Casey? Hope all is well. BGS, appreciate the support. Thanks for sharing the video. Hope you're well. Good brother. All right. Um, all right. So at another Chicago clinic, Dr. Ira Chasnoff, a pediatrician, was testing kids and teens who'd been adopted or were in foster care and having serious behavioral issues or problems. Um, his examinations were more comprehensive, involving a thorough assessment of intelligence, executive functioning, speech and language, sensory processing, and social skills, among other factors. They involved a team of professionals and took a full day or more to complete. Chasnoff's findings published last year, nearly 30% of these youngsters had fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. 80% had not received a diagnosis of this kind previously. Now, see, this is important because a lot of times when they write kids off, we don't often find out why. As I know, you know, I worked in Philadelphia when I was doing my, my some of my graduate work and I worked in a facility where I was responsible for teaching a class, a GED course. And I was working directly with Philly kids. Uh, this was 96 to 97. And most of those kids had not been tested for anything of significance. And they had gone through all kinds of trauma um, and you could tell working with them. But I can tell you, among other things, FASD was not one of the things that uh, they had been tested for prior to coming into that facility. Anyway, um, and, I, and matter of fact, the same. I worked in um, in uh, Southern California in uh, Nickerson Gardens and all throughout Compton. And there were a lot of our kids that, that weren't uh, really tested in a lot of areas they needed to be. All right. So such studies... Um, See, let me make sure I didn't skip anything. Yeah. Such studies, along with others across the country, are bringing fresh attention to the impact uh, of exposure to alcohol in utero. Bell excels at changing the way people think, said Jean Griffin, a retired professor of psychiatry at Northwestern University's Medical School. There's no question that the young African-Americans that Bell is trying to call attention to are engaging in high risk behaviors. Griffin continued. Question is, how do we explain it? Uh, how do we respond? Are the kids bad? Are they traumatized? Are they mentally ill? marked by adverse environments, or do we trace their behavior to their exposure in utero to alcohol? All of these possible ways of looking at the same data, Griffin said, uh, all of these are possible ways of looking at the same data by highlighting the brain damage caused by alcohol, Griffin said, Bell is trying to get us to see these behaviors through a different lens. Absolutely. Um, Okay, so this is a section titled, I want him to uh, be able to fend for himself. Susan Earle is still coming to terms with the partying she did in her mid-20s before she became a mother. Back then, she used to spend most weekends at clubs with friends. She usually had a few drinks. Her boyfriend at the time encouraged her because it loosened her up. She was about six weeks into pregnancy when she learned she was expecting. She said, I stopped drinking as soon as I found out, but it wasn't soon enough. Quentin Mills, her son, born four weeks early, had the characteristic facial features of fetal alcohol syndrome. His speech was delayed, and in kindergarten, he started biting, kicking, and screaming. He was bullied by classmate, classmates. He wet his bed until he was 12. Um, so these are developmental issues. Now, 14 years old, an eighth grader, and a patient of Bell's, Quentin is in special ed, doing work at the second or third grade level. His thinking skills, they're not that good, Earl said on a recent morning at her home in Calumet City, south, uh, south of Chicago. If you uh, tell him to take out the trash, he won't remember a minute later. I don't know if his mind goes off or what. Arriving home from school, the boy mumbled brief answers to his parents' questions. Um, you know, usually one word answers. I'll skip ahead a little bit. As Quentin went back to his room, his stepfather, Nathaniel Earl, became pensive. I want him to be able to fend for himself, he said, but if you ask... Him, who is the president or what's going on in the world? He can't tell you. I worry about that. Another section, a warning to young women backfires. Earlier this year, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention advised all sexually active women of childbearing age to abstain from all alcohol unless they're using contraception. 
The warning was aimed at the more than 3 million women in the, in the U.S. at risk of bearing children with FASD, but it was widely ridiculed. See, now we're getting to the crux of why I'm reading this to you, right? It was widely ridiculed. Women called it condescending. Yeah. That backlash points to the difficulty of preventing FASD. Doctors and therapists, including those who deal with children's learning disabilities and behavioral problems, are extremely reluctant to inquire whether a mom drank while pregnant. I can't tell you how many providers don't want to ask. There's so much stigma attached to identifying women who are drinking, said uh, Cable, the Emory University psychiatrist. Alcohol is so pervasive in our culture, but no one wants to talk about it. Even when physicians do ask, it can be hard to get accurate information. Some women think having a beer or a few glasses of wine a couple of times a week, social drinking, not heavy drinking, doesn't count. Others think that if they stop drinking, uh, when they find, found, find out they're pregnant, they're in the clear. Others simply deny having had any alcohol. Officially, the CDC estimates that about 10% of women in the U.S. drink during pregnancy. Uh, other research cited by Chasnoff suggests that figure may be as high as 20 to 35%. Conveying the risk of fetal alcohol exposure is difficult because not every woman who drinks during pregnancy will have a child who's affected. It depends on how much alcohol she consumes at various times during her pregnancy, as well as her stress level, right? Her nutrition, how she metabolizes alcohol, and her baby's genetic susceptibility, among other factors. The research is clear. No amount of alcohol can be guaranteed to be safe, even in a pregnancy's very early stages. As soon as three weeks after con uh, conception, uh, before most women realize they're pregnant, binge drinking, defined as four to five drinks on a single occasion, can cause the kind of brain damage that underlies the symptoms of FASD. The more women continue to drink, the greater the risks to a fetus. Studies indicate that alcohol exposure alters the brain's wiring, disrupts brain's con brain connections, and leads to brain cell death, causing permanent injury that interferes with normal development. Even one drink during pregnancy can lead to a child with deficits in thinking, judgment, and self-control, reflected in a tendency to lash out, throw tantrums, and ignore rules, according to a, a, a 2001 study published in Pediatrics. It's not that these children won't listen to their parents or teachers, it's that they can't process what they're hearing and translate it into action. Their brains are impaired. Right? For the most part, the root cause of these children's problems goes unrecognized and children end up being blamed for behaviors that are really biologically based, often which they have over which they have no control, Chasnoff said. Aggressive interventions at an early age can help kids with FASD learn how to regulate their emotions, break activities down into steps and think through problems. You have to raise these kids differently than other children, Bell said. But that's especially hard to do in disadvantaged communities where professional help is scarce, scarce and getting um, along day to day is so difficult. Without intervention, kids with FASD often get diagnosed with mental illness and put on psychiatric drugs at a very young age, or they're offered interventions at school that don't address the full range of their deficits, or they never learn how to control themselves and they grow up finding themselves in a world of trouble. Okay. Let's see here. Let me catch up a little bit with some of the comments. Um, yeah, T Fitness. Yeah, this was hitting me this week too. I just decided to do something about it, man. Just put it out there for a discussion. I mean, it's not like it's a new topic, but when I think about how often it's talked about, that's a whole different question. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. Da, 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 da. Okay, brother. Uh, brother Truth says, "I uh, never knew that." Thanks for the information. We all need to know. Um, absolutely. What's up, narratives and dialogues uh, with Qualfinino? I hope I didn't mispronounce that. I probably did. I apologize. Um, yeah, but this is what we're dealing with. Right? This is what we're dealing with. Now, this section I want to read. Just because we can actually see some faces and attach that to it. So this is called Saving Treshawn. Right? Aura Jackson won't forget the day she took custody of Treshawn Jones. He was two months old and bawling nonstop. Frantic, a teenager who had been taking care of him, walked into Jackson's house and handed him over. 
She gave him to me and ran out the door, Jackson remembered recently, in her home in a tough South Side neighborhood. I put him on the bed and saw that he wasn't a bad baby. She just didn't know what to do with him. Jackson, 56, who never had children of her own, loved Treshawn or Treshawn and raised him as her own son. But it hasn't been easy. His mother, Jackson's great niece, had been living on the streets, drinking and doing drugs without her uh, throughout her pregnancy. I started noticing when he was three that something wasn't right, Jackson said. He'd have tantrums like I'd never seen before. I took him to a doctor and they told me uh, he was an overactive child. But I was like, no, I know something's wrong, not just that. Uh, in kindergarten, Treshawn would get into fights and ignore his teacher. Jackson marched him over to uh, Jackson Park Hospital, um, where... Appreciate that support. Uh, okay. All right. Um, where a pedi uh, pediatrician recommended that he start seeing a counselor, treatments that continue weekly to this day. Treshawn was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and started taking Ritalin, which helped a bit. But still, he couldn't tie his shoes. He mumbled when people asked him to speak clearly, and he kept on having problems in school. Jackson pulled out her phone and showed a text Treshawn's teacher had sent the week before. He's in rare form today, fighting and cussing, and everything else will be well, uh, everything else will not be quiet in class. And another, acting up again, won't shut up, stop talking, and focus. Two years ago, Jackson took Treshawn back to Jackson Park Hospital, where he was evaluated by Bell. He cannot sit still. He has a bad temper, but this is a nice kid. A psychiatrist wrote in an initial case report. Treshawn, he wrote, had a clear history of fetal alcohol exposure. Bell's advice, give the boy vitamin A, folate, omega-3, and choline, um, or choline, a nutrient that plays a, a role in brain development. Animal studies and studies of young children with FASD suggest it might ameliorate some of the brain damage from fetal alcohol exposure. But there's no solid evidence that choline can help other children or adults. In general, we think that choline helps early on in development, but we're a lot less clear about later. Jeffrey Wozniak, an associate professor of psychiatry and co-director of the FASD program at the University of Minnesota. It's too early to even say this is a treatment. That doesn't phase Bell, who likes to be ahead of the curve. I don't care because I'm, I'm a clinician, and as a clinician, I get to do what makes sense to me, he said. Academics, they can afford to be purists trying to count the hairs on a gnat's ass. <laughs> I ain't mad at you, Bell. Get with it. Uh, what's up, Marty? Hope you're well. Um, let's see here. Right, got 113 watching. Please like, share, subscribe, support the channel. But make sure you like the video, if nothing else. I appreciate it. I'm trying to get my numbers uh, to 25,000. I'm not too far off. Um, I'm hoping you guys will assist me in that matter. All right. Um, an extraordinarily sneaky foe. On a recent morning, Bell strode through the psychiatric ward at Jackson Park Hospital wearing a green lab coat, black sneakers, and a black baseball cap, uh, part of an extensive collection of hats. FASD is extraordinarily sneaky and covert, he said, before entering a patient's room. His diagnostic, diagnostic approach relies on triangulating a person's birth history, prematurity, heart murmur, low birth weight, uh, their educational history, special ed, speech, language problems, explosive temper, their cognitive skills. Can they spell world backward? Appreciate that support, T-Fitness. Um, can, uh, can they spell world backward and count down from 100 by sevens and whatever he can learn about the family background and propensity to drink? I sometimes, sometimes learn the father is an alcoholic. And that's important because if he's a drinker, chances are he's going to influence her to drink. Interesting. Let's see. Outside of his clinic duties, Bell is trying to spread the message about FASD, F FASD wherever he can. Recently, he gave a talk about it at Mahari Medical College in Nashville, his alma mater. A few weeks later, he traveled to D.C. to uh, discuss it uh, at a committee of the National Academy of Sciences. Bell is also trying to convince the Cook County Juvenile Temporary a detention center in Chicago to screen youngsters who've gotten into trouble with the law for FASD. In the end, Bell hopes to show that African-American kids who are dropping out of school and ending up on the streets are there because of social detriment, uh, determinants of health, such as alcohol use. Perhaps then communities would see alcohol for what it is, a bigger problem, cocaine or heroin, and kids whose brains were damaged in utero 
would get treatment instead of being labeled as deadbeats and failures. But he's not sure if people really want to hear this message, his message. Uh, I've been told all my life that African-Americans are intellectually inferior, Bell said. I'm terrified of what I found because it might feed into this stigma by suggesting that brain damage is more common in poor black communities than elsewhere, reinforcing painful stereotypes. But what it really says is that if we want social justice, we have to address the fetal alcohol problem. Right? That's what we're looking at. That is what we are looking at, people. This is the issue. A shout out to this brother for doing this work, putting it out there, making sure it's something that we have on the table. I haven't heard much about his work since this piece. I plan to delve in and look a little more further at it, but I wanted to get this at least on the table uh, for some of you who may not know. And there are others of you more than likely who are well familiar with this material, whether it be from your own research or from life experience, or maybe even your own upbringing. But I would, uh, I would urge you to consider the people in your life that you've known, um, you know, and whether or not this may be something that they're grappling with. Because at the end of the day, as we know, uh, because alcohol is so easy to get, it's more than understandable that this might have an adverse impact on how our communities function. Okay. So putting that on the table. Now, the, the main reason I wanted to read this piece, though, is when they talked about this notion of this being a condescending dynamic. It was argued that the women that they were trying to get this information out to found this to be condescending and therefore didn't want to hear about it. It was considered offensive in and of itself. And the safety of pregnancies, the safety of even unborn children were made secondary to how people felt about the information. That's the core issue that I wanted to bring up alongside the importance of looking at FASD in our lives and questioning people around us who may or may not have been affected, even even grown adults. I'm not limiting that. Right. But just having that on the table for us to process. But the secondary reason I, I decided to do this was the extent to which even scientists can't tell women anything. This is something we hear Kev say, or at least we used to a couple months ago. Kev used to ask the question, uh, Kevin Samuels, to the women he was interviewing. Who can tell you anything? Well, scientists are having the same problem. You know? How to actually get a message out that may affect actual birth rates, may affect the quality of birth and the quality of unborn children's lives. And yet, when bringing the issue up, you're immediately met with what is essentially the same culture that we, we see on a larger scale. It produced Me Too. It produced BLM. Thanks for that, Man Friday. Um, and it is a, it, it has a kind of really infiltrated every aspect of gender dynamics, right? But even when it comes to science and what it attempts to do to improve the quality of health and people's lives, you can't question women. And it's more than just being a faux pas. It's actually becoming an inherent social ill to not only even question women, but to give insight, to give advice based on scientific data. That's a hard pill to swallow, especially for fathers who may be interested in having a child. You can't control her behavior. Now, doctors and scientists can't even tell her to be mindful without it being a problem. So this backlash they talk about in response to just trying to warn women about the difficulties of FASD is an issue. Right? Absolutely. So that was it. I just wanted to drop that in there, put, put something in your cap for you to consider, something to take with you and something to process. And we may expound on it later. I may do more. I'm interested in reading the comments and seeing what you guys have to say about this. I more than expect to hear people tell me about their own experiences with this, whatever that may mean. It could be a friend in elementary school. It could be a 
parent. Hell, it could be a girlfriend with kids that have FASD, whether she's had them diagnosed or not. But I'm curious to know, particularly from you brothers, because that, you know, we're 95 percent of my audience are black males, which is what I'm actually going for. I want to know from y'all what your experience has been, if any, with FASD, but also consider the possibility and remember what we pointed out earlier in terms of the identifiable right, symptoms. Um, one of the things they talk about are flat cheeks, a thin upper lip, folds at the corner of the eyes. Um, these are features of fetal alcohol syndrome. I didn't put any pictures up here, but I'm sure you can actually Google that. But I'm, I'd like to know your experiences with it, right? So I hope you guys are well. I appreciate you guys coming in. Thank you for supporting the channel. I will try and be back on tomorrow. I'm trying to get back in the groove. So other than that, y'all take it easy. Peace. Thank you.